I'm going to hand over to Dave now. Um, so Dave Rickwood, I'm sure he will introduce himself and I'm sure most of you um, know him, but he is the site manager and project manager um, at Fingal. And this evening, um, he's going to talk um, all about the ancient wooden restoration um, that we've been doing um, over the last five years um, and share kind of why it is so important and some of our kind of key success stories. Um, so I will hand over to Dave now. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, as Ellie says, great to see you all. Well, I can't see many of you actually, because I've got various things up on my screen, but anyway. Fingers crossed it all goes to plan tonight because it certainly didn't go to plan uh, earlier in the week. Um, so um, for those of you who are not familiar with Finger Woods, but obviously a lot of you are um, and are unaware of the geography, because I think some folks are joining us from far and wide tonight. Um, Fingal uh, Woods sits on the very edge of Dartmoor uh, on the sort of northern fringe, and it's an east, uh, so west east uh, running valley. There are nine kind of river valley systems uh, that rise on Dartmoor. Uh, and this is the team, the River Team. So it's quite close to the A30. And a lot of people are familiar with the name Fingal when they've been heading down the A30 for their holidays to Cornwall. And so uh, this is a, a, a bit more of a close up of the valley. So Fingal Woods is sort of three sort of separate blocks of woodland. Um, and the woodlands were acquired in partnership uh, with the National Trust in 2014. Uh, in total, those three woodland blocks make up about 350 hectares. That's about a, a thousand acres, roughly. Um, but this section of the Team Valley is probably one of the most wooded uh, valley sections on Dartmoor. Uh, and so this thousand acres sits within a further two and a half thousand acres. Um, now, although we call it Fingal Woods, it's actually a complex of a number of smaller woodlands. So I think there are seven or eight different woodlands that actually come together uh, to create what we call today uh, Fingal Woods. Um, the woodlands uh, at Fingal largely sit on the southern side of the valley and the valley is very steep. Um, and so the slopes are all facing north. So they tend to be quite cool and quite damp. Um, but this gives you a, some idea uh, of the geography and how it's broken down by area. At either end of Fingal Woods, the National Trust own uh, the Drogo Estate in the west and Steps Bridge and St Thomas's Clee uh, to the east, uh, part of which is managed by the Devon Wildlife Trust uh, on a lease from the National Trust. So just to give a, uh, a sort of description of what ancient woodland is, ancient woodland is somewhat a kind of an arbitrary kind of line uh, drawn in time, really. Um, so mapping across England in particular um, was fairly consistent at the point of 1600. And so that's used as the kind of point at which to determine whether something is ancient woodland or not ancient woodland. Um, so if woodland appeared on maps in 1600, it's largely deemed or assumed that it was probably woodland um, uh, throughout the previous 1600 plus years. So it's assumed to be ancient woodland at that point. Um, now that doesn't mean that it's not been felled. It doesn't mean that it's not been replanted to conifer. Um, and it doesn't mean that it hasn't been managed in any way. Um, it just means that woodland this has been existing in existence on that site uh, uh, for as long as uh, certainly is mapped and is presumed to be a lot longer than that. So we tend to talk about ancient woodland in two ways. We describe it as ancient semi-natural, i.e. where it's largely composed of uh, semi-natural species, or it's described as pores, uh, which is a plantation on an ancient woodland site. So Fingal is largely a plantation on an ancient woodland site. So um, it's almost uh, two thirds, maybe three quarters conifer. Uh, and then there's a, a smaller part that's broadleaf, but even that has been heavily managed uh, and some of it has been planted in the past. Um, now, what's unusual about Fingal Woods is that uh, the history of the site is very well documented. 
um, and it's well archived. And that's really quite useful in terms of us understanding what's happened there in the past. Um, perhaps one of the well, most well-known uh, uh, references uh, comes from 1170. And there was a man called William de Tracy who actually owned two of the woodlands at Fingal, one called Coleridge Wood and one called today St. Thomas's Cleeve. And William Tracy was one of the knights that was responsible for the murder of Sir Thomas of Becket. Uh, and when William de Tracy was uh, on his deathbed in the Crusades to try and atone for his sins, he actually gifted uh, those parts of Finger Woods to the monks of Canterbury at that time. Um, so there's this amazing colorful history uh, about the woods. So the next slide shows a couple of activities going on in the woods. Um, and they're quite interesting, really. So the chap on the left with the horse uh, is a collier. So he would have been working in the woods, uh, making charcoal. Uh, and the chap on the right is stripping bark off of oak coppice uh, for tanning leather. Now, although these pictures were taken, um, you know, uh, in the sort of 19th, early 19th century, uh, the woodlands have been managed really for a thousand years for these two products in some respects. So Coleridge Wood, which is one of the woods that was owned by the knight William de Tracy, Coleridge, although it's spelt like Samuel Taylor Coleridge, actually is referring to colliery, it's actually referring to coal. And uh, that part of the wood has clearly been managed for charcoal for more than a thousand years. Um, and that's really important to try and understand that in the context of the ecology of the woodlands today because where the woodlands have been managed for charcoal uh, and as oak coppice for that period of time uh, the whole site has been very very heavily depleted and the soils are very acid and very poor and that's a result of a cycle of 25 every 25 years the oak coppice being felled uh, and converted to well uh, bark for tanning leather and charcoal for a myriad of products, but probably one of the most significant uses of charcoal on Dartmoor was around uh, 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 mineral extraction, um, so for uh, creating ores from iron, etc. So you've got this very long history of management, um, uh, and it changed. The woodland changed hands a number of times in that period, but it was largely a kind of settled ownership. And we jump forward right now to. I've got to angle my camera. Someone's asking me to angle my camera. Is that better? Okay. Um, we come, we jump forward really um, to the early 1920s, early 1930s. And this picture here um, is of a gentleman called Leonard Helmhurst uh, and his wife, Dorothy Whitney Strait. Uh, so I can see a question. <laughs> I'll leave the questions till after. Um, so, this couple here moved to Devon um, uh, in the 1920s, and they were very keen to explore the potential of actually creating a large woodland estate on Dartmoor. Um, but it's important to understand that these two were involved in the setting up of what became the Dartington estate. And I imagine most people are familiar with Dartington, um, but probably most people will be familiar with Dartington because of its arts, education and culture. Uh, but it was also involved in many, many businesses um, uh, across Devon. But Dorothy Whitney Strait was a very wealthy woman. Uh, so Leonard Elmhurst uh, chose well when they were married. Um, and between them, they set up this enormous uh, enterprise that was looking at uh, creating wealth in the rural economy. In this period after the end of the First World War, you've got the economic depression of the 1930s. So it was this philanthropic vision, really. Um, and using their wealth, um, they were able to engage some of the best people at the time in all sorts of fields. But on the forestry side, they engaged a guy called Wilfred Hiley. Uh, and he was a forestry academic from Oxford. Uh, and they also uh, employed a forester called Tom Brown, who had formerly worked for the Crown Estate. Uh, and he also, incidentally, was also involved in the planting of the first tree that the Forest Commission planted in North Devon. So you've got these wonderful people uh, coming to uh, the Teen Valley, as it were, or acquiring the Teen Valley in the early 1930s. 
And it was they who set about converting all of the oak coppice at that time to conifer. And the reason they were doing that was because largely the oak coppice had fallen out of favor. Uh, coal was much more freely available and transportable and coal largely displaced charcoal as a means uh, for, certainly for um, uh, in mineral extraction and many, many other uses. So you've got this long history um, uh, and you've seen how the woodlands have been converted to conifer in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and so there's this element of timelessness about these, these woodlands. Um, and the Woodland Trust and the National Trust acquired the site in 2014. And we're engaged merrily in the process of slowly trying to convert this woodland um, back into something that's slightly more semi-natural. Um, and one of the reasons we're doing this is really because biodiversity is increasingly under uh, a significant threats as the climate is changing. And we're seeing bigger and bigger impacts really um, from human activity uh, across our landscapes. And whilst we often refer to, you know, maybe large uh, animals in the African plains or polar bears uh, becoming extinct or close to extinction, we're now beginning to see some of those effects directly in front of us on Dartmoor. So the picture in uh, that Tom's showing at the moment is of a wood warbler. It's a male wood warbler. Uh, and that was captured down by Fingal Bridge only four years ago. Um, and we part funded a piece of work that was being led by a chap called Dr. Malcolm Burgess at Exeter University, trying to understand uh, better the ecology of this species. But in the period of time that we've owned Fingal, this species has largely become, it's certainly locally extinct in the Team Valley. There aren't any pairs in the Team Valley now. And there's probably only seven pairs, I think, across Dartmoor this year and five the year before. Um, and so we're beginning to see these things happen, but we don't really know why this has happened. Uh, and probably what's somewhat confusing about these signals we're getting is wood warblers are a sub-Saharan uh, migrant uh, to the UK. Uh, this species is the pied flycatcher, another sub-Saharan migrant, but this is doing better than it's ever done. Um, uh, in these uh, wooded valleys on Dartmoor. And so the contrast between these two species is quite striking. Now we know a lot about birds, um, but we don't actually understand why these things are happening. Uh, but there are lots of other taxa in the forest that are studied, you know, are not studied in any way, in any way, shape or form by the, in the same detail. Uh, and we just don't understand really what's going on with them. Um, but we realise they are all becoming increasingly under threat. So this is the first slide again, but it's worth showing you this one. This is a, a slide called Team Tail, and it gives you a sense of the landscape for those of you who have not been there. It's a steep valley. Um, on the left-hand side is the big conifer blocks of, uh, of finger woods, and on the right-hand side is steep uh, sort of slopes of... Uh, bracken, birch and oak wooden gradually beginning to de develop. Um, and in the distance is that's where the River Teen rises at a place called Scorrel Down right in the far distance. But you can see it's a very steep slope, slopes uh, with a river running through the bottom of it. Now these big valley systems on Dartmoor uh, are often referred to as refugia. Um, and that's because they're likely to be the sorts of spaces, places that are going to sustain some of these species that are under threat uh, due to the changing climate for the longest period. So this term refugia is often, uh, often bounced around about these kind of sites. Now, this valley before it was managed as upland oak coppice and before it was managed as conifer would have really been something we would refer to as upland oak wood. And upland oak woods are quite unusual in as much as they only really appear uh, throughout the west coast uh, of England in places like Cumbria, Devon, Cornwall. Uh, and they have these oceanic uh, species associated with them. And they don't really appear in many places outside of the UK. There are some places on mainland Europe where they appear, but they're actually quite important both at a European level, but also as an international level in terms of the, the species assemblages they support. So we do really have a significant kind of responsibility uh, 
to try and restore uh, these habitats. Um, so this is another river valley system on Dartmoor uh, and it's called uh, the Bovey Valley um, and we're looking up to a place called Hound Tor and you can see this complex mixture of native woodland and conifer and what's so positive in some respects about these sites is actually when we as we remove the conifer because these are really species rich valleys we can actually uh, you know, we've actually got something to play with in terms of those species will start to move and migrate into some areas of the, of the coniferous parts of the forest that are currently um, not as hospitable as they might be. But as we start to thin out the conifer and remove it and introduce more light, um, they will become much, much more attractive to a whole range of species uh, throughout these valleys. So I guess the important thing to understand about woodland restoration, which is really uh, the key uh, to this to this discussion this evening is it's all about introducing light into these woodlands. Now, sometimes an undermanaged woodlands, whether it's native or non-native, um, uh, will have declining light levels. And as the light levels decline, the species associated uh, with these habitats tend to decline as well. And so you do need these kind of interventions. So whether they're natural interventions like storms or grazing animals, or in the case of conifers in this, this instance, it's about thinning them and opening them up because as conifers grow, they're very shade tolerant species uh, and light levels fall and decline uh, and the habitat declines as a result of that. So it's not a complex process, it's about bringing back light really. So what I would say to a lot of people is that whilst there's an urgency uh, in terms of restoring uh, some of these sites. It's really about beginning the restoration process that's really the key because all of these woodlands, um, no matter how uh, heavily planted they have been, um, they will have fragments and remnants of uh, native species uh, and habitats within them. So it's about removing some of the conifer, in this case, buffering, uh, and you can mitigate some of the worst threats uh, just by actually beginning the process of managing these sites. Um, but once that process has been started, there isn't the need to rush. You don't need to rush through it uh, to some form of completion. So we would argue, and certainly I would argue from experience, that it's better to do it gradually. There's no need to clear, fell and remove uh, uh, some of these non-native species. It's about doing it gradually and working with the resource you've got. Because a lot of species require some sort of uh, continuity in terms of uh, the woodland canopy. So whether that continuity is being provided by native species or non-native species, that's really important. Um, so I've, I've covered some of this stuff clearly already, but uh, this picture is here from a site called Westcott Wood near Dockham. Um, and it's a stand of uh, a North American conifer called Western Hemlock. But throughout this block, of woodland, there are these fragments of old growth. Uh, so this is a uh, pre-plantation oak tree that's nearly overtopped by all of these conifers. Uh, and the reason why that pre-plantation pre-plantation oak tree is there is because it's growing in amongst all this granite glitter. So I can, you can see the rocks in the foreground. And that's actually a little bit of a pool of semi-natural vegetation. So the management process here really is about actually thinning the conifer around that tree and effectively haloing it. And it allows that area around the rocks and the vegetation that's in there to actually recover. So the things to focus on when you're looking at restoration is you're looking at pre-plantation trees, you're looking at the archeology span of the site. So old historic boundaries, edges, um, they often contain these fragments of semi-natural vegetation. Uh, linear features like streams and watercourses and drainage lines uh, are really important. And it will be those places where you'll find these, what we refer to as ancient woodland indicators in some of these more specialist species. So, so that's an old historic wood bank uh, at Fingal and it's separating actually uh, to the left um, is actually land that would have historically been pasture and to the right actually is ancient woodland. Um, 
but that hedge bank in itself will have and does have a whole load of old veteran trees. Now, this is a different hedge bank at Fingal, um, but where that chap is standing, Steve, that's a big old veteran oak. And uh, it, that's the same tree on both the left and the right. And you can see how that tree has been overtopped by the fast growth of the conifer. Now, we've done some thinning work there, and removed a proportion of the conifer, and the crown of this tree has actually responded to that thinning work. So just by reintroducing a bit of light, we've given this tree uh, a future, really. Um, and where Steve stands in the picture, uh, you will now have sort of dog's mercury, bluebell, wood anemone, a whole range of species beginning to reestablish along the line of what was an old boundary. Uh, so this, this old veteran uh, is an oak tree that was at some stage, uh, if you can imagine, this was part of the hedgerow system. It had been laid, which is why it's sort of laying on its side. And again, this is in the same hedgerow system that in the previous picture. And as we've opened it up and given it a bit more light, it's begun to come, it's begun to come back to life. Um, so these old sort of veteran hulks, they may not be these enormous trees you often see in parklands, uh, but they're really important features uh, in our woodlands. So these are the sorts of places where you might have bat roosts, um, uh, for example, and these corridors, these, these old boundary features and linear features like streams become essentially corridors along which the wildlife in the forest moves around. So ecological continuity, uh, I mentioned this a moment ago. So our preference, uh, and I think uh, it's a wise, uh, a wise choice, it will be to avoid clear felling large areas. Um, and this gives you an indication as to why. So down in the bottom left hand uh, of, this, of this slide is uh, something called a blue ground beetle. And I think I'm right in saying that's probably the, uh, the biggest uh, beetle that we have in the UK. Um, but it only is present on a handful of sites on Dartmoor and in, in Wales. Uh, and it feeds on uh, slugs uh, and particularly ash black slugs. But if, if a site is clear felled and all the trees are removed, um, there's some scientific work that indicates that it actually takes about 100 years uh, for those slug populations to return to those sites. Um, and so whilst we're not, you know, uh, blue ground beetles are not quite as iconic as wood warblers or uh, pied flycatchers, they're an important part of that whole woodland ecology. Um, and so uh, if by clear felling we'd actually remove their food source, it would be a great shame really. Um, up in the top right hand of this slide uh, is a bat called a barbastel bat. Uh, and we have some colonies of barbastel bats in the Bovey Valley um, and also in the Teen Valley and uh, in the Dart Valley uh, on sites that we're involved with. But this little stand of conifer in this picture, which you can't really see because of all the inserts on it, has some scruffy little oak trees scattered through it. And there's one little scruffy oak tree in particular that's probably no more than a, a foot in diameter of that, but it's got a big kind of lightning strike on one side uh, that's calloused over. And that actually is a maternity roost uh, for these bats. Uh, and again, if, if all of the conifer had been removed and we'd clear felled it, that tree will become very vulnerable. Uh, and that scar in which uh, the maternity roost sits would probably dry out. And those bats would then need to move on and find another home. Um, so you can have a big impact uh, 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 by actually clearing large areas of woodland um, too quickly. And the last one I'll talk about here is the red ants. Uh, so there's an ant's nest there. And, and the ants actually quite like and favor um, uh, the, uh, I was gonna say nymphs, I've lost my words now, um, the aphids uh, on the conifers. So they actually climb up the trees and feed off the aphids. So again, if there were no trees there, there'd be no food source uh, for the wood ants. So we've talked about some of these species here. Um, and there's a, uh, a fungus here with something called lemon slugs uh, crawling all over it and feeding on it. But what's interesting about this site is this is an ancient woodland site, but it's quite small and it's isolated now. Um, and if 
large parts of that site were clear felled and uh, removed and replanted, you would lose this ecological continuity. So you'd lose the slugs, you'd lose a lot of the fungus because the food available for them to actually um, uh, uh, regenerate wouldn't be there. And because the site is now isolated and it's no longer surrounded by ancient woodland sites, um, these, these species would find it very hard to migrate back onto the site. Um, so this question of ecological continuity, which I think we're getting better at understanding, uh, is quite significant, really. I do want to say that actually uh, restoration is also about cutting trees down if you're going to put light into the forest. So, uh, and this is a pic, this is a little video we took about a week or so ago. The chap who's felling this tree is called Barry uh, and he works for us most winters uh, and he's really skilled at doing this uh, but he was formerly an ecologist um, and he's got a great understanding of the function of the woodlands really. Um, so that's a brilliant bit of footage um, but that's a Douglas fir tree in a place called Hound Tor Woods. Um, and hopefully Barry's going to turn his saw off now. Um, and a lot of this timber is really very useful. So this is a, 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 a going to be cut for a 24 foot saw log, um, which will be used for all kinds of structural use. Um, and restoration is not a cheap process. So being able to actually generate some income from the work you're doing as you remove these trees is really uh, a significant contribution actually to the long-term uh, you know, sustainability of this type of work. So one of the other factors um, that we're having to deal with now uh, as part of the restoration of a site like Fingal is tree disease. Um, and I think tree disease is likely to become even more significant than it already is really. Um, so at Fingal we've suffered from a disease called Phytophthora morum that impacts on uh, a species called Japanese larch um, and once you've identified Japanese larch because uh, sorry once you've identified Phytophthora remorum um, you've normally be served with something called a plant health order so you need to remove all the infected trees within about six months and that's to try and stop the disease not only spreading to other Japanese larch trees but actually perhaps more significantly spreading into some of the native flora so something like bilberry for example uh, would be killed by uh, uh, the same disease. So this is Hall's Clee wood uh, in uh, at Fingal and it's a small side valley that runs off of the main Teen Gorge and it's about 100 hectares but this block of larch is 15 hectares uh, and it was felled, had to be felled in 2015 as a result of this disease and it, it produced about 5,000 tons of timber um, so that's probably couple of hundred lorry loads of, of timber. So it, it was a big, a big job. And so just to give you a sense of the scale, um, that little blue and white tractor in the middle there uh, belongs to a couple of chaps called Ryan and Royston, a father and son team. And you can just see their yellow jackets just to the right of the tractor. Uh, but it was a very big, steep slope. And those tiny little matchsticks uh, that are laying on the slope were actually huge trees. Uh, so big saw logs, is, they weren't quite as big as the tree that Barry was felling in the previous video, but they were nearly as large as that. And so this was a massive impact uh, on our wooden restoration plans at Fingal. So as I said earlier, we would prefer not to clear fell because we, we, ha we think it has probably has a negative impact on the ecology uh, of some of these sites. Um, but hopefully you can see in this picture on the right hand side 
um, we managed to save quite a lot of the understory. So all of those uh, trees that are beginning to come into leaf, and this is the first spring after we undertook the felling, we managed to actually retain a lot of them. The central section, which is just to the, to the right, uh, the conifer was much, much more um, dense uh, and hadn't previously been thinned. So there wasn't actually a lot of understory to, to retain. And then further right still, there's a much bigger lump uh, where we, again, we managed to retain uh, a lot of the oak understory that was growing. Okay, so this, this actually is a, a video uh, that shows actually uh, what happened after the clear fell. So this is a small area that um, following the edge of the stream where we managed to retain a lot of the hardwoods. So I've, I've missed a chunk of this, but you can just see there's a bit of a dam there. Um, so as part of the res restoration of Hall's Cleave and in this part of the wood, uh, we've also started to essentially uh, renaturalize to some extent the water course. Uh, and we're actually allowing water to pond up, uh, perhaps in the way that a beaver might, uh, might do by creating small, uh, what we would call natural flood management uh, and small dams. Um, but the video is spinning around the hillside now. Um, and on the right hand side is that area where we had to do some planting. Okay, this is uh, Ed, my colleague, with his uh, small uh, lumber mate band store, uh, using some of the small diameter uh, rambled conifer that's come out of uh, Fingal. Uh, and he's just getting it onto the, the saw bed now. Uh, and then he's got it locked in place and he can start pushing the band saw through it. And there's the band saw in action. You can see the straight line where it's made the cut. And then once he made the cut, he has to turn it, cut it again, and he's working to try and get a, a, a square section, a cant out that then he can put the slices through uh, to start milling out the actual finished piece. And this material is going up onto the high moors for, uh, to help with the peak restoration work. Um, uh, but it's a great little bit of kit that Ed's got, and he can all do it just on his own. So as, Jim was alluding to there, the, um, uh, the timber that, that we, we're currently milling on site is, and some of it is being used as part of this peatland restoration project. So some of the peatland on Dartmoor is beginning to dry out and where it's drying out, it often uh, starts to form these small gullies during heavy rainfall. Um, and this is now beginning to wash away uh, some of the peat and you're getting areas like this where the peat is actually all kind of degrading and effectively you're getting these erosion gullies beginning to form. Uh, and that's quite damaging in terms of the peatland and the habitat on the high moor. Um, but it's also probably our most important and most significant carbon store. Uh, so this is thousands of years of carbon being stored here. Um, but as the, the surface vegeta vegetation breaks down, um, uh, the peat is actually being washed away into the river systems uh, and so we're actually beginning to lose uh, this enormous carbon store. So the, the work that Jim's been doing uh, with some of his team has actually been creating these small timber pieces and this is the timber being used to actually secure some of these washed out gullies uh, on the high moor. So you've got this restoration process going on in the ancient woodlands and then the timber is being used to restore um, some of these important uh, carbon reserves that we've got sitting on top of Dartmoor. But also, not only that, as we start to hold the water on the high moor, and this is a chap called David Leach from the Dartmoor Peatland uh, uh, project, you start to see things like sphagnum moss beginning to, to regain and they start to hold the water on the moor. I hadn't realized this, but sphagnum can hold something like 14 to 25 times it's kind of dry weight in water once it's saturated. So it becomes a really important sponge uh, in the center of the moor. And obviously as uh, the climate changes and warms up, uh, being able to make sure that we retain that carbon storage on the high moor and the, and the, uh, the habitat that's created by the sphagnum mosses uh, is really an important process. Today I've been putting timber up this stand of spruce with the horses. 
been using two methods of extraction. We're using a swingle tree, which is a, sort of a bar you drag behind the horse yeah. over a choker chain, and something a little bit more sophisticated, which is a timber arch. So it's like a buggy behind the horse, two wheels, and you can ratchet the butt of the log off the ground. We're using this method of extraction because um, it's very low impact. It's, it's quite dry at the moment, but when it's damp, as soon as you stick a vehicle with traction wheels, you, you'll churn the ground up. If you put horses in the stand of trees, you can get the, uh, the timber out of the woods and, and leave very minimal impact on, on the woodland floor. I brought two horses today, Polly and Bino. Polly's an Ardenne, uh, which is a breed from uh, French Belgian borders, and Bino's a Comtois, uh, which is a southern French draft breed. Uh, very similar size, about 16 hands, and the particularly strong for their size. We try to go for about sort of 400 kilo pulls and that sort of keeps them fresh enough to last the day out. So really the only point I'm trying to kind of emphasize here that it's, it's really important as part of this restoration process, uh, we make best use uh, of the timber. Um, and because Fingal is such a difficult site to work, we have to use a whole range of kind of techniques really. So we do use some large machinery and mechanized harvesting, but most of the site is inaccessible to a lot of the big machinery. So we use a lot of small tractors uh, and more sort of, I suppose you might call more agricultural type forestry equipment. Um, but there's also a place for things like horses uh, because we have a lot of sensitive parts of the site that are really inaccessible and difficult to get to. Uh, and so the, the horses are often bringing timber to the machinery so it can be processed. Um, so we actually need a whole variety of kind of uh, subcontractors with different techniques and different processes to actually harvest a complex, steep uh, valley site like Fingerland. So I seem to have lost the screen for a minute. But just to give you a bit of an idea of what the historic harvesting team looked like. So all of these gentlemen here uh, worked at Fingal uh, for much of the kind of period between the 1930s right through to the, the 1960s, 70s. And this was the kind of 1952, this picture was taken. And this was the team of people that worked in the woods at that time, uh, employed by Dartington. So you've got some people here that were specialists in terms of horse logging there were people here that were responsible for running the nursery where the seedlings were grown. Um, uh, there were people here that were actually saw doctors. So they were actually uh, sharpening the saws, uh, not only the hand tools that were being used on site, but also in the sawmill that Dartington uh, uh, created at Morton Hampstead. Um, so we've got the backstory of a lot of these people here, um, but we haven't quite got enough time, I'm afraid, to go through that. Um, but I can happily give you more information about that if you, you would like. So this is more the modern team. Uh, so Jim, who was speaking earlier, um, uh, is part of the team uh, in this picture. Um, and we have a, a team of ecologists. So we've got a picture of our ecologists. We've got a team of rangers, the National Trust rangers. Um, and then there's many, many volunteers who support us in our work at Fingal. Um, and, you know, without all of this all of these people involved, we really couldn't achieve uh, what we've achieved and what we hope to achieve in the future. Um, one of the most effective things that we've done at Fingal, I think, over the past uh, five or six years is actually tell the story of the restoration, uh, the people involved, uh, the timber, the species uh, and the impacts it's had. And this picture here is a group from the Royal Forestry Society. Uh, who came to Fingal a couple of years ago, and this is part of their annual tour, and they were doing a tour of the Southwest, uh, and they came and visited us uh, for a day uh, on a beautiful, sunny April day. So telling the stories about what we're doing and sharing that and sharing what we've learned and the mistakes we've made has been a really important aspect uh, of the whole project. And I think... Um, We'll probably leave it there. I wouldn't worry about the last slide, Tom, um, as I'm conscious we've only got 10 minutes left. Um, so maybe what we could do is flick on to the slide that just says uh, questions. So hopefully um, that's given you all a little bit of a flavor uh, of Finger Woods and the work that we've been doing.
yeah we'll end on that pretty picture thank you very much dave um that was really really interesting i work alongside you every day and i still manage to learn something new um so thank you um lots of questions have been coming um in um through the chat box but if you've got any more um make sure you um pop them in there um so the first question um that came in right at the beginning that i think you spotted was did oak coppicing involve the felling of the trees or was it true coppicing? Um, it was it was true coppicing. Um, so they would have essentially uh, coppiced the oak uh, every 25 years. So the trees wouldn't have been particularly big. Um, they would have been relatively easy to fell uh, and handle because they wouldn't have had any big machinery and they would have been working all of these steep slopes with wood. Um, but they literally removed everything. So obviously they stripped the bark for tanning leather. Uh, the timber was used for making charcoal and then all the minor branch wood uh, would have been removed for a whole myriad of purposes. So it was a very um, uh, intense process and it happened literally every 25 years approximately. So in a century, you would have had four rotations of oak coppice. So hopefully that's answered that. Perfect. The next um, is around whether there are any concerns for allopathic soil under the conifers for broadleaf regrowth or planting. So perhaps it's um, worth starting by kind of explaining allopathy and then um, answering the question. I'm not sure I entirely understand what allopathic is, but I imagine it's... I think my understanding <laughs> is it's where an organism produces kind of biochemicals that in some way influence the growth or survival of other or like organisms. So it can be positive, but I think in this case, it's perhaps yeah. more referring to the negative um, yeah. implication. I don't think it's um, a big issue. I mean, if it was if it was rhododendron or laurel, and we had lots of rhododendron or laurel, I think it would be a big issue. Um, but the main problem uh, with the conifer, uh, particularly where we've had multiple rotations, so on, on this site you might have had three rotations of conifer, is where we're actually losing soil. And that's because the vegetation, the light levels have been so poor for such a long time, the vegetation on the surface is lost. So it's less to do with the fact that the um, uh, that this allopathic relationship is actually preventing uh, the regeneration because once we actually introduce light and we lift the light levels, um, we are finding the actual ground floor is re-establishing, trees do begin to establish and in fact where we've done some planting where where hand has been forced by uh, felling, for example in, in that slide I showed about the tree disease, actually the tree growth has actually been pretty impressive actually it's not been uh, bad at all so uh, on the whole I wouldn't say that that's a, a big issue um, this is a very acid soil and acid substrate and I suspect if we were dealing with something that was a bit more base rich it might be a problem but it's not a problem here I don't think um, you mentioned um, pests and diseases and that um, segues nicely into the next um, kind of question um, Bearing those in mind, um, how are you planning for kind of longer term um, resilience? So there always seems to be a kind of a new tree disease um, on the horizon. Yeah, it's, it's, a, that's a, it's truly the most challenging question of all that we constantly wrestle with at the moment, because there are a lot of tree diseases uh, coming down the track. Um, so I think in truth, we need to be far less prescriptive about the species uh, that are growing on these sites. Um, so whilst we're in the process of restoring uh, uh, the site to a largely more native mix, and there is certainly some evidence to suggest that native species are likely to have a greater sort of genetic diversity. So they may be uh, to some extent less vulnerable uh, to some of these catastrophic diseases. Um, really we've got to be looking at a much, much more mixed woodland complex and, and conifer will be part of that and so will many other non-natives. Uh, but what we would like to see is actually a greater proportion of, uh, of, of truly native species in that mix. And I think there's an element of actually 
crossing our fingers because I don't think we can head off all of these diseases and we just need to try and make the whole landscape much, much more diverse, much, much more semi-natural um, and try and blur the edges. So around the site, make sure the sort of site is expanding into the wider landscape really and that our neighbours and our friends locally are also looking to the longer term or what that might mean in terms of uh, tree disease and pests. Um, so I hope that's kind of answered it, that kind of answered your question, but there really isn't an easy answer to that question at the moment. We just don't know enough. Absolutely. Um, the next question is around um, the surveys that are undertaken. Um, so whether we do kind of before and after surveys of the flora, fauna and mammals before we um, undertake the restoration. Um, and then uh, the second part of the question is whether we share the kind of the findings um, of those surveys with kind of other organisations. Yeah, so we, we've been very lucky actually. We've had a lot of uh, uh, brilliant people involved with doing some of the survey work. So we've started an annual breeding bird survey that started from the very beginning. And the idea behind that was to see if there were any trends uh, in the numbers of species and the, and the range of species we're getting across the site. So that's been running now for six, seven years. And it's Tom who's been ably assisting us with the presentation tonight, who undertakes that. Um, we've done some species with bats, looking at uh, the range of species. So a site like Fingal uh, probably has 11 or 12 of the 17 UK bat species. Devon Wildlife uh, uh, consultants are undertaking annual, annual surveys of the ground vegetation in terms of vegetation transects. And that's to try and actually understand what changes are occurring as we start to restore the woodlands. Um, uh, some of our volunteers are involved in uh, annual butterfly transects. Um, and that actually proved to be one of the most uh, challenging, I think, uh, of some of the ecological work we're doing because um, invertebrates seem to be so heavily affected by the weather. So it's very difficult to see any patterns in that sort of data at the moment. Uh, the site's exceptional for dormice. So I think we're about to move on to our third PhD relating to dormice. Um, so yes, there's a lot of survey work being done. Uh, you can find out about it on the Fingal Woods blog, and Ellie will mention that at the end. Um, but if you want actually to get hold of any of the actual reports or papers, um, it's just a question of letting us know, really. Um, in terms of gaps, I think some of the gaps we've got we probably don't know enough around uh, fungi, for example. That's not an area that we've done a lot of work in. Um, although we do know that the deadwood resource uh, is very depleted in Fingal. Uh, and so that's an area that we do actually realize we need to do a great deal more work on. So hopefully that's helped. What was the second part of the question, where it was? It was how we um, kind of share that of other organizations. So I think the only thing I would add to what Dave has said is that if there is an established methodology, so for example, with the kind of the butterfly transects, butterfly conservation has an established methodology. So wherever there is one um, and it has kind of been fit for purpose at Fingal, then we have um, adopted it. And then all the findings go into those kind of contribute towards those kind of national um, surveys. And, and likewise, um, the pied flycatcher research um, all of that contributes into bigger kind of monitoring schemes as with the dormice. So yeah, there's certainly um, a lot of kind of knowledge sharing. Um, we are running out of time, but we've just got a couple um, of quick questions um, to go. Um, so one of them is around how much of the timber um, we are able to sell um, and kind of what percentage um, of the overall budget it manages to kind of cover. Yes. Okay, so uh, so all the timber we can sell, we do sell. Um, uh, so we're constantly looking for opportunities uh, and markets, particularly local markets on our doorstep. Uh, so the story Jim was telling about the, the peatland work we've been doing has been really good because it's it's been enabled us to utilize a lot of the low grade material that we might sell into low value markets that might have quite a lot of road miles. So it's actually helped us through uh, uh, solving that issue. Um, 
but right now uh, the timber probably only really covers the cost of the harvesting and a little bit more maybe um, but that's because the woodland uh, the current sort of growth status of the woodland is that most of it is actually still quite young so there's very little mature timber at Fingal. Most of that was felled in the 1980s uh, and early 1990s. So a lot of the timber we're dealing with around about 200 hectares is what you might describe as first thinnings. So it's low value, but very expensive work. Um, and much of the, the first thinnings work has been abandoned uh, under the previous ownerships because it's just so uneconomic to do. Uh, but we've undertaken to do that. But having said that, because a lot of this site has growing quite good quality Douglas fir, in the next 20, 30 years, there will be this enormous timber resource that will be, um, that will provide an enormous economic boost to the project. Uh, but in the short term, there's a lot of investment needed to actually uh, essentially see that um, uh, timber reserve or timber resource come to fruition. Two final um, questions before we wrap up. The first is about how old um, the woodland in the Teen Valley um, would have been. Um, so whether it's kind of um, post um, ice age, for example, so whether that it was that continuous um, forest from there until the time it was converted into conifer. So I think the assumption is that yes, it would have been. Um, so we haven't talked about it tonight, but there's an Iron Age hill fort at Fingal, uh, but there's an indication that that was settled in the Bronze Age. So certainly parts of the landscape of Fingal would have been actually much more open, uh, sort of that post Ice Age period than they are today. But there's undoubtedly, it's undoubtedly the kind of landscape that would have had this kind of, uh, I suppose, primeval forest uh, developing on it, but not over the whole site. So the forest actually is probably bigger today than it would have been, undoubtedly. Perfect. And I think um, if it's okay with Jim, I'm gonna draw you in um, for this final question. Um, so this is around how durable um, softwood is in the kind of the Dartmoor conditions. Um, and it was posed um, just after the kind of um, the slide around using it kind of um, in buildings. So I'm guessing um, it was in relation to that. Yes, um, well, it depends which species of softwood. Uh, two of the uh, best timbers for structural use on a, from a softwood viewpoint are, are Douglas fir and larch, both of which grow, grow in the Fingal Valley, have been grown. Uh, and they are in durability class three, which means they last without treatment for between 15 to 20 years. Um, there's also another species uh, within the valley, uh, Western Red Cedar, which is durability class two, um, which is uh, the same durability as, as oak and sweet chestnut. So that's a little bit more superior and that will last um, uh, between uh, 20 to 25 years uh, without any treatment. And, and obviously with the, the, the Myers work, the, the uh, the, the good news there is that the acidity of the bog water, uh, when the, the, the timber's there holding that, that will, the timber will effectively be pickled in the water. Um, so, uh, and it only needs to last for perhaps five to six years uh, before the sphagnum, we hope, is reaccumulating, and then that's doing the job of helping hold the water up on the moors rather than the, uh, the dams by that stage. Um, so who knows if the peat keeps accumulating, we have um, you know meters of peat and our little dams there, uh, blackened uh, archaeological relics. By the time the uh, yeah the archaeologists get to it, in another thousand years or so. Perfect. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, we are going to um, call it a night here. Um, so I just want to. Um, thank Dave again um, for that presentation and also um, he was very ably assisted uh, by Tom on technology um, and Jim obviously um, fielding some of those questions um, and talking to the mill. 
I don't think we actually um, properly introduced Jim, um, but Jim is from Whitewood Management and he is one of kind of many of the, the contractors that um, Dave has mentioned. Um, and also I want to thank all of you um, for coming along. Um, many of you um, are volunteers or involved um, in Pingle um, in many ways. So thank you um, for your help and your support. Um, and thanks for everything you do um, because you make um, this restoration um, possible. So that's it for now. Um, I will pop um, in the chat box a link to the Finglewoods blog. So if anyone what does want to know anything um, more about what we've been talking about, then that is the best place to look. Um, and our next um, single lecture, and we promise that we will have ironed out all of our technical uh, glitches by then, will be on Thursday, the 5th of November. Um, and this time, um, rather than being behind the screen, Tom will actually be in front of it. Um, Tom has been doing a lot of research, uh, both in Fingal um, and also in a number of other kind of um, wooden trust sites across Dartmoor into bats. So he's going to be sharing um, some of the findings. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you on the 5th of November. <laughs>